If you asked your average party member in communist China to describe communism, they might mention some of your name check slogans like controlling the means of production and moving to a socialist economy, something about the proletariat, working class uniting, worldwide revolution. But if you asked Mao Zedong, who was the chairman of communist China from the 1930s all the way through the Chinese communist revolution after World War II, and then all the way through to his death in 1976. If you asked Mao Zedong to talk about communism, it wasn't just about that name check stuff. For Mao, it almost always had to be fanatical. Every aspect of life for Mao should be permeated by the Communist Party and what he saw as a fanatical and people-driven transition to full-scale communism. In the mind of Mao Zedong, there were no half-measures. Here's historian Frank DeCotter summarizing this fanatical attitude that Mao had. Quote, In communist parlance, after the socialist transformation of the ownership of the means of production had been completed, a new revolution was required to stamp out, once and for all, all the remnants of bourgeois culture, from private thoughts to private markets. Just as the transition from capitalism to socialism required a revolution, the transition from socialism to communism demanded a revolution too. Mao called it the cultural revolution, end quote. So after Mao and the Communist Party took over China at the end of the 1940s and into the early 1950s, they tried a lot of things to make this fanatical transition to communism. The culmination of that early radical transition to communism was probably known as the Great Leap Forward. Now, I did a series on the Great Leap Forward, starting with, I think, episode 14, so I definitely recommend checking that out, but the basic idea was this was going to be Mao implementing his economic policies and basically implementing communism in China. He collectivized the economy, he mandated forced industrialization quotas, he came up with agricultural and irrigation schemes, putting thousands of people to work, trying to change the geographic layout of China. And again, you can get the details there in episode 14, but long story short, the result was the deaths of tens of millions of people. Some historians say 50 to 60 million, maybe as many as that. And Mao learned a couple of lessons from the Great Leap Forward. First of all, he felt like the vultures were circling. So to understand Mao, you have to understand that he saw himself as the center of the communist world. So he was not only the ideological and the economic and the political leader, but he was also the personal leader. Here's historian Frank DeCotter again talking about Mao's personality. Quote, Like many dictators, Mao combined grandiose ideas about his own historical destiny with an extraordinary capacity for malice. He was easily offended and resentful, with a long memory for grievances. Insensitive to human loss, he nonchalantly handed down killing quotas in the many campaigns that were designed to cow the population. As he grew older, he increasingly turned on his colleagues and subordinates, some of them long-standing comrades in arms, subjecting them to public humiliation, imprisonment, and torture. The Cultural Revolution, then, was also about an old man settling personal scores at the end of his life. These two aspects of the Cultural Revolution, the vision of a socialist world free of revisionism, the sordid, vengeful plotting against real and imaginary enemies, were not mutually exclusive. Mao saw no distinction between himself and the revolution. He was the revolution. An inkling of dissatisfaction with his authority was a direct threat to the dictatorship of the proletariat. End quote. I think the first thing to understand from that description is 
it's kind of like the opposite of the Godfather, where the Godfather was, you know, it's not personal, it's just business. Well, for Mao, it was the total opposite. It was not business, it was personal. Everything he did was personal. He was always trying to settle scores. He was always thinking about his historic legacy. And he felt like he was the personal leader of the people. So he watched as the Soviet Union underwent what was known as de-Stalinization, where Khrushchev and some of the later leaders of the Soviet state kind of denounced the cult of personality around Stalin and tried to build better relationships with the United States and the West. And Mao worried that this same de-Stalinization would end up turning into de maoification in China. He was worried that his legacy would be erased. So any other prominent members of the party like Liu Xiaoqi or Deng Xiaoping or any of these other kind of up-and-comers, he was terrified that these guys would replace him. The other lesson that Mao learned from the disaster of the Great Leap Forward, sadly, was not that his policies would end up killing millions. The lesson he learned was that he didn't make things personal enough. He didn't include enough of the people. He just focused on the policies and implementing the policies, but he needed to focus on the people, to rile people up, get people fanatical about what he was trying to do. And in a way, Mao Zedong fanatically trying to make the people as rabid as possible for that communist transition, that full-scale communism, in a way, that is the Cultural Revolution. First, Mao unleashed the youth and what was known as the Red Guards, and he tried to get them to be critical of old party members and old ways, old ideas, and eventually he unleashed the population as a whole. What erupted is something that was unforeseen and couldn't be controlled. Because ultimately, in China, you saw what you wanted to see in the Cultural Revolution. If you were a young student, you saw a chance to glorify a brilliant leader and maybe step away from the old orthodoxies and some of the old authority figures like your parents. If you were a party member, you saw a chance to get even with other party members who maybe you thought weren't doing things the right way and perhaps you could use this cultural revolution to get even. If you were a victim you saw what was basically a full-scale nationwide purge going on for 10 years. So ultimately, people saw what they wanted to see, and the result was different factions fighting against each other as this thing unfolds. So it could be party members versus party leaders. It could be any people versus suspected quote-unquote rightists. It could be just anyone who had a personal vendetta using the Cultural Revolution to get even. Here's historian Frank DeCotter again talking about this idea. Quote, Different factions jostled for power and started fighting each other. Mao used the people during the Cultural Revolution, but equally many people manipulated the campaign to pursue their own goals. End quote. As a result of this, the Cultural Revolution went through many different phases, but the ultimate results were going to be wide-reaching and impactful for not only the people who were living through it, but generations of people who would live after it. Ultimately, in a lot of ways, by the end of the Cultural Revolution in 1976, many people had begun to act on their own in China to subvert the planned economy and reject the thought of Mao Zedong. Even party leaders in China realized that this couldn't continue after the death of Mao. And that brings up the question of how do you criticize Mao and how do you move away from some of his policies while also maintaining legitimacy? Because remember, Mao Zedong wasn't just the chairman of the Communist Party, he was the Chinese Revolution. And he was, in many ways, communist China. That dilemma is something that the leaders in China today are still fighting through. In addition to that 
legacy of Mao and try to work through it as a country, you have to remember the human cost of the Cultural Revolution. It wasn't as deadly as the Great Leap Forward, but historians estimate that maybe 1.5 to 2 million lives were lost. These deaths were the result of beatings and torture and murder and executions and starvation and neglect, all of these factors that we're going to be talking about here during this series. But perhaps an underrated impact and result of the Cultural Revolution was just the cultural devastation that the Cultural Revolution unleashed on millions of people. This truly was a lost generation, in the same way that we say the people who fought in World War I and the families who were affected, all those millions of people were lost generation in that sense. It's the same way here with the Cultural Revolution in China. And it's underrated because how do you measure that scientifically? How do you measure psychological damage to tens of millions of people and their families? And then how do you measure whether or not that psychological damage gets transferred to the next generation? And how much of that psychological damage gets transferred to the next generation after that? It's tough. But it's not impossible. One of the things you can do as a historian is try and find some of the victims of the Cultural Revolution who are still alive today and attempt to interview them and try and get their thoughts and get their perspective on what happened during the Cultural Revolution. Historian Anne Thurston did just this. She interviewed dozens of survivors of the Cultural Revolution, people who were impacted by it in ways that are totally devastating, and people who were impacted in lesser ways. But here's what she says about that cultural devastation. Quote, It is upon the invisible scars, the invisible wounds, that this study focuses. Or, as a friend and colleague once advised me, what you have to listen for, what you have to hear, is the slow, silent scream. The wounds, by and large, really are invisible. The screams really are silent. Everyone I interviewed was a functioning member of Chinese society. Some were still suffering from the physical wounds inflicted upon them during the Cultural Revolution, but none has had to stop work completely. This was not always true of their family members, some of whom were so psychologically or physically wounded by the Cultural Revolution that they have been unable to resume work. And many of the families with whom I spoke had lost one or more of their members, whether through beatings, suicides, factional violence, or the refusal to grant medical aid to the so-called counter-revolutionaries. All had lost friends. While this article is concerned largely with the wounds and scars that are legacies of the Cultural Revolution, what is most remarkable really is not the wounds, but the tremendous resilience of those who have been through so much. End quote. Of course, we saw that resilience firsthand with the story of Red Scarf Girl and Zhang Ji Li, who made it through the Cultural Revolution and all the amazing things that she was able to do to survive. And I think surprisingly, when Ann Thurston did this study and interviewed some members of the Cultural Revolution, and it kind of matches up with what we saw from Red Scarf Girl, but what was worst about the Cultural Revolution for a lot of people wasn't necessarily the death and the torture and the beatings, but it was more the humiliation aspect of it or the loss of culture and the loss of what people find valuable in life. Here's Ann Thurston again talking about this, quote, One of the questions I asked most people was what in their judgment was worst about the Cultural Revolution. The answers were diverse. A woman academic who spent several years cleaning her university's latrines said that it was the burning of the books. She said that the Cultural Revolution was supposed to be a cultural revolution, but had instead become a revolution against culture, a revolution that destroyed culture. A young man who had participated in the burning of the books on his campus, on the other hand, made a distinction between physical violence and spiritual violence, and said that spiritual violence was really more difficult to bear. 
For him, what was worst was to return to his campus after having participated in the Cultural Revolution in other cities after the worker-soldier propaganda teams had come to his campus and to see the university professors sweeping the grounds, cleaning the toilets, and making and serving food in the campus dining halls. Some said it was the distortion of facts, the absence of truth. One young man who had been an early participant in the Cultural Revolution said it was the loss of hope, the loss of ideals. Others said it was the dehumanization. End quote. And here's a survivor of the Cultural Revolution talking about what they regretted the most. Quote, what I regret most is not the suffering that I and my family went through, but the fact that so many of my friends and colleagues died before they were rehabilitated before their names were cleared, end quote. So it seems like there was something about that isolation feeling and the feeling of your friends losing their reputations and their ability to be a part of something. And many of the survivors of the Cultural Revolution specifically remember moments where when they had been kind of outed as you know, terrible members of society and horrible communists and someone who was rightist or revisionist, there were these moments where someone stepped up and lended a hand or did something nice to them, and that little moment of kindness really makes all the difference. Historian Ann Thurston talks about this, quote, Everyone with whom I have spoken who was subjected to similar isolation recalls vividly those brief moments of human contact and the individuals who risked making them. Many of today's firmest friendships are based on such memories. One woman whose task it was for several years to clean the toilets on her university campus still remembers those who dared to inquire after her health and encourage her to persevere, those who merely turned their heads away in silent embarrassment, and those who hurled derogatory epithets. Today, her hierarchy of female friendships is based in large measure upon how women behaved when they were confronted in her university bathrooms. Those who dared encourage her, she counts among her very few truly trusted friends. Those who remain silent, she forgives because she understands the difficulties people faced in having any contact with, quote, ox ghosts and snake spirits. Those who hurl derogatory epithets are beyond her forgiveness, end quote. Of course, what was worst was when that humiliation and that isolation was combined with physical abuse and even torture. Here's what one survivor says when they were recalling one of these public humiliation torture episodes. Quote, They made me put my head in a classroom desk. They made me put my head inside the shelf, and then they began beating on the outside, on the top and bottom of the shelf, beating my head that was inside of the shelf from above and below. It only frightens you. It doesn't really hurt you. They tried not to kill people when they wanted a false confession. But when they were hitting me like that, I peed, involuntarily. My physical response was out of my control. Ordinarily, I retained my composure. But during the actual process of being tortured, during particular processes of torture, it wasn't so much pain as that I couldn't control my own physical response. End quote. This seems to be a theme here where it's not so much the physical pain and the consequences of that, but it's the humiliation and it's the embarrassment and it's the public shaming that is remembered. And that's something that's ingrained in your psychological outlook for the rest of your life. At the end of the day, for the people who went through the Cultural Revolution there's no denying the human cost and the millions of lives who were lost and the effect that has on friends and family members. But it was also the loss of all the things that make life fun and meaningful. Family, friends, art, culture, literature, any type of fun, whatever you're interested in, you name it, it was affected by the Cultural Revolution. Because remember, Mao wanted this to be a fanatical movement that touched every aspect of life. And the result of it all was not just a cultural revolution, but a cultural devastation that would 
destroy the lives of millions of people for generations to come. Okay, so that does it for part one in the series I'm doing on the Cultural Revolution in China. So this was kind of just an introduction um, to some of the bigger themes that we're going to be talking about in the series, and I don't know how many episodes it's going to be. This is one I've wanted to do for a while, so hopefully um, it works out, and I'm going to take my time with it, so I'm not sure how many episodes it'll take. As always, I just want to say thanks for listening. Um, The plan after I finish this series is I want to get to some of the topics that you guys have emailed me about, suggestions that you've sent on Twitter or um, by email, which has been really cool uh, to hear you guys suggesting things uh, that I can cover. And I feel like if you guys are taking the time to listen and let me know that you're enjoying it, and if you can take the time to do that, then I can take the time to hopefully do a couple episodes on stuff that you guys have suggested, as long as it's somewhat in my wheelhouse. So that's the plan going forward, and as always, thanks for listening. Be good.